So my task here is to give you a, a short story of the uh, macroeconomic imbalances from the point of view of the so-called periphery. Uh, so at this point, I think that uh, almost everybody or uh, I think most of you are familiar with uh, certain charts and uh, uh, graphs. So um, I'll, uh, t uh, given the time constraint that I have, I skip them. And uh, I will uh, directly go straight, direct, uh, straight to the points that uh, I think are more relevant in this story and more controversial uh, to a certain, uh, at least to a certain extent. So le let me think, uh, let me say that our reading of the story is very much on the side of the uh, impact of. Uh, capital market integration. So we, we, we claim that uh, under, um, uh, with, with the monetary unification and with the uh, related decline uh, in the perceived um, country risk of the periphery, uh, what we saw was this uh, convergence in nominal interest rates, so which, by the way, was the main reason for which the periphery uh, wanted to be part uh, of the euro area, perhaps from a strictly economic point of view. So uh, the, this cheaper access to credit uh, led to a financial cycle divergence between core and periphery, which had its counterpart in the build-up of macroeconomic imbalances. Uh, in their turn, these growing imbalances uh, amounted to widening uh, positive gaps between uh, domestic demand on one side, or absorption, if you like, and GDP in the periphery that mirror uh, negative gaps in, in, in the so-called core. Um, over time, these flow imbalances uh, led to uh, the peripheries accumulation of huge external debts. Uh, again, mirror uh, by the core's accumulation of large positive uh, net international investment positions. So what are called uh, stock imbalances. Uh, and very important, in the periphery, domestic demand bloated by external borrowing uh, sustains the rapid growth of the so-called non-international, uh, non-internationally tradable output, mainly construction, uh, especially in Spain or Ireland, uh, public uh, sector in Greece in particular, uh, everywhere personal services, retail, <laughs> and so on. So uh, this led to uh, raising, uh, accelerated the price and wage, nominal wage dynamics, especially in these sectors, sectors not exposed to international competition. And um, uh, and, and this also led to a slowing down of aggregate productivity, a, a growth as a composition effect to a certain extent at least. But at the same time, this allowed convergence in GDP per capita with the core, as, as we saw um, yeah. also this morning in some of the presentations that we had. Uh, then what happened? So in our interpretation, the U.S. financial crisis, uh, subprime crisis, uh, acted as a sort of trigger. Uh, why? Because it changed market sentiments worldwide, so reducing the appetite for risk and determining a flight to quality. So this put an end to what we call the beneath neglect, whereby financial markets up to that point at loop at the uh, um, euro area imbalances. 
And then as all of us, of us we, we, we know uh, quite bad, quite well, the revelation of the uh, true figures of the Greek public deficit was then the beginning, the official beginning of the crisis. We, uh, this determined what is known as a sudden stop of capital inflows, uh, and especially in those peripheral countries that had run large uh, current account deficit and that have accumulated a, a sizable uh, negative uh, net international investment position in the previous years. Uh, even Italy, that by the way, that had not run either of them, uh, at least not to the same extent that the other uh, peri peripheral countries uh, did, uh, started having serious problems in rolling over its huge public debt. So uh, uh, important, given the impossibility to go on financing its excess expenditures, the periphery is, uh, had a large fall in uh, domestic demand and uh, a destruction to a large extent irreversible of non-tradable output. So four observations. First of all, uh, we think that the crisis and the dynamics of the crisis uh, was very much an endogenous process fed again uh, that at the capital flows as the driving force. Uh, so that we may say that the crisis was not caused by some uh, exogenous shocks, asymmetric or not, uh, as here doesn't matter so much. This does not mean that there were no uh, exogenous shocks uh, in, the, in, in this first 10 years of the Euro, like, for instance, the entry of China in the WTO. Uh, but uh, w we don't think that these were crucial in determining the crisis. So again, uh, we think that the US subprime crisis acted more as a trigger than as a, a causal uh, input to the crisis. Second, the competitiveness deterioration in the periphery was, of course, another effect of the above mentioned process, but not an autonomous cause of it. Uh, why? Because more, very shortly, because nominal wages were driving up by the fast growing domestic demand, which did not in, uh, at the same time this uh, expansion of domestic demand concentrated very much in the non-tradable sector did nothing to enhance the productivity, in particular, the productivity of the tradable sector. So, uh, third point, uh, uh, when the bubble, the credit bubble burst, absorption had to fail, domestic demand had to fail rapidly in the periphery, uh, since both private and public entities lo located in uh, this area could not any longer finance their excess spending. So this de-emphasized, we think, the debate on austerity because austerity was only a part of this inevitable uh, uh, collapse of domestic demand in these countries. Although, of course, in a longer, uh, in a longer time perspective, it's not irrelevant if uh, how the fall in domestic demand is distributed among consumption, uh, private investment, and government expenditure. That's for sure. But especially in terms of the uh, uh, intensity of re the recession, we don't think that we could make so much different the distribution of the falling domestic demand between 
again, consumption, investment, private investment, and uh, uh, government in a short, in a short-term perspective. Uh, for uh, again, this point that um, when a credit bubble burst, a, a large amount of the GDP, in particular the non-tradable output that was created during the bubble, uh, had to be destroyed, and to a large extent forever. Why? Because it's not sustainable. Uh, since it was created to satisfy the excess spending due to the credit bubble. So let me spend one minute at, uh, at least for an important digression, <laughs> I, I think. Uh, why? Because we think that the concept and the use that is done of potential GDP as a measure of the output level uh, at which the intensity of resource use is neither adding uh, uh, to nor subtracting from inflationary pressure, concept linked to the NIRU, so-called uh, NIRU uh, output level. Uh, we think that one of the lessons of the European crisis, but more in general also of the years of the so-called great moderation is that inflation can remain subdued, low, stable, even when the economy moves along an, an uns uh, uns unsustainable path. Uh, and one implication of this is that conventional measures of the output gap, based again on, on the uh, notion and the concept of the NIRU, uh, perhaps has to be replaced by other measures which take into account also uh, financial variables, uh, such as credit levels, leverage ratios, asset prices, uh, housing prices. Uh, so we, we claim and uh, we advocate a replacement of uh, measures based on the notion of potential output with the notion of sustainable output. Uh, by the way, we, I think one could argue also that um, the fact that conventional measures were um, used was also at the origin of the over-optimistic predictions regarding the intensity and the duration of the recession, recession in the periphery that were made at the beginning of the, of the euro debt crisis. And also the, the issue concerning the, the underestimation of fiscal mu multipliers, uh, especially in the periphery, we think that has to do with this. Uh, so if for those of you who are interested in, um, in this issue, uh, the main reference here is Claudio Borio and his team of co-researchers at, at the Bank of International Settlements. Um, so from our narrative, it follows that a recession was inevitable in the periphery. But again, what's about its intensity and, and growth? Uh, we, we think that this depend, depended mainly on three features. So the size of the imbalances, both the flow and the, and the stock imbalances that were really unprecedented. So this was one of the reasons, if you think that Greece, for instance, had, uh, um, I think, 70% current account deficit uh, at the moment of the crisis. Spain was above 10%. And we, without saying anything about the uh, external debt that had accumulated at the moment of the, and, and, and then of course the institutional context that no doubt about uh, this. Um, so, um, uh, if the recession in the periphery was so long and painful, again, uh, part was simply. Uh, 
uh, an effect of the of the size of these imbalances. But um, second, because and this is where the institutional context uh, came into scene, uh, the fact that this adjustment process uh, was supposed to take place uh, in, a, in a regime subject to three constraints, no devaluation to preserve the monetary union, no bailout to avoid future moral hazard, and no default to avoid losses to the creditors, first of all, but also to avoid uh, another uh, Lehman effect, another uh, global contagion and instability event like the Lehman bankruptcy. So <laughs> perhaps now there are an inflation of impossibility theorem around, but perhaps we may say that these three things together, uh, no external devaluation, no bailout, no default, probably, uh, yeah, cannot go together. Um, so as we know, at a certain point, the no bailout clause was officially removed. The, the, United, Sta the United States uh, managed this problem in a different way. It's, we, we may say that the, the no, no default clause, which is not apply there, uh, local or uh, public entities like municipalities can go bankruptcy. Uh, so um, let me skip this. Uh, as everybody knows, uh, one of the problems then was that uh, it was difficult to reconcile these two objectives of uh, to recover, to restore competitiveness on one side, and at the same time uh, to, deal, to deal with the debt, uh, especially in a deflationary environment. This made uh, for the periphery extremely difficult, especially to reduce the debt levels. So from that point of view, we, we, may not, we, we cannot say that there were so much success. So wh wh where we are now, uh, uh, we, we may say that these imbalances now uh, are over, but be careful because the financial account of the balance of payment uh, is in equilibrium only thanks to target two. And uh, let me skip. Uh, but, but in the periphery, uh, we have high unemployment, it in particular is a young course that is mainly concentrated in some low income areas of the southern periphery, uh, which are those areas affected by structural weaknesses which, uh, as we have seen more than once in this conference, which do not show any sign of converging to the core. Uh, so let me finish just giving one word about this regional dimension of these uh, imbalances. So because we have cures that, or we think we have cured, then we'll see in the other presentation what we may say about uh, if really uh, the problem is, uh, was uh, cured uh, in such a way that we don't have to expect uh, uh, resurgence of the problem in the next future. Uh, but we, we are left with uh, these big problems of regional uh, uh, disparities, which again have their, uh, which have their uh, roots in entrenched differences in fundamentals, which are very difficult to be cured. Uh, okay, I finish with this. Thank you. Thank you.